uh, we have 40 minutes, so I want to just launch in because I, I, I always like to have questions and answers at the end because I sometimes think it's actually more important than the talk, some of the issues that come up in the Q&A section. So I want to be sure and have 10 minutes so they're going to tell me when I have 10 minutes left. Um, so my, my topic is integrating humanity and divinity. And those of you who are familiar with my teaching and my work know that that's a pretty big theme in my, in my message and in what I share with people. Because I think that too often uh, the trajectory of awakening has been kind of half presented. I think there's a kind of interesting movement up and out of the merely human, realizing that we're not limited to this human being, to this body, this mind, this personality. We need to awaken up and out of that and realize I'm not only that. But then there's a return movement, I think, as well. So there's a, there's a transcendent movement awakening up and out of. Then there's a kind of imminent, a movement of imminence. Transcendence and imminence. So it's kind of a full circle. So then we awaken down and into our humanity. And my own tradition, the Christian tradition, especially the mystical Christian tradition, uh, has a really rich understanding of that awakening, awakening down and into. You know, and it's symbolized in the whole incarnational spirituality and incarnational story of Christ um, where, you're, where you're seeing divinity enter into humanity. So I think it's important to have both those movements in order for there to be a comprehensive awakening or clarity, uh, a, a kind of opening to understanding reality sort of in every aspect. So there's, a, there's an old aphorism by Shankara uh, Adi Shankara, the founder, by some people's estimation, of Advaita Vedanta. And it's a very well-known aphorism, probably many of you have heard, and it goes like this. It says, the world is illusion. Only Brahman is real. The world is Brahman. So there's three parts to the aphorism. The world is illusion. Only Brahman is real. The world is Brahman. So in this topic of integrating humanity with divinity, I'd like to take that aphorism and kind of twist it a little bit in order to make clear how it applies to this aspect of humanity, of the human condition that we all live. So in, in adapting that little aphorism to, for my own purposes for this talk, I would like to say that the personal self, our humanity, is illusion first part of the aphorism. Only Brahman, or the totality, is real. And the third part, our humanity, our personal self, is the totality. That's the kind of way that those three sections of that aphorism by Shankara, I think, work in terms of the human, the human aspect of who we are the personal aspect of who we are. So when awakening first happens, pre-awakening, you could say, the pre-awakened person, human person, is really pretty convinced that their human aspect, their personal aspect, is really the center of the universe. And if you doubt this, just ride on a freeway at rush hour or go to a grocery store on a, on a Sunday when it's really packed. And you can see that the vast majority of people on the planet are suffering under a kind of an illusion that their humanity, the human part of who they are, the personal part of who they are, is the center of their universe. And they're kind of living this life that's sort of frustrated over the fact that other, all these other people don't get that. <laughs> you know, why can't they get it? It's all about me, you know? But we don't get that because we're all these people walking around thinking we're all the center of the universe. And what does that, what does that kind of create? Well, sort of like what we have, you know? <laughs> A bunch of people all walking around thinking they're all the center of the universe, which doesn't quite work, does it? I don't think. So we awaken up and out of that. We realize that's not quite the truth. You know, we're so identified with perceiving things through the personal filter, through the filter of our personalities, through the filter of our conditioning, of our very self-centered conditioning that's based on this belief that we're somehow separate from the rest of reality and that we're the center. 
And everything else revolves around me, 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 me. So we suffer under this illusion. I think it's important to realize that awakening happens on many different levels. And there's many different depths of awakening. Awakening is just not a done deal. That's why I I really don't like the word enlightenment so much anymore. Because it kind of connotes or it kind of implies that it's a done deal. You're enlightened. It sounds very final, you know. It sounds, sounds like there's no really... Uh, that there's a kind of end to it. It's like, okay, I'm finished now. And even some people in some non-dual circles, you'll hear people say, well, I'm done, or they're done. You know? There was one little group that will remain nameless that I've had some contact with, and uh, they had a lot of, uh, they were just a little kind of non-dual group, and they asked me to come and do some retreats and talks and things. And now I actually have some students that had been in that group now or no longer so much involved in it. But in that group, there was a kind of cultural culture of enlightenment where people would say, so-and-so is done, you know. Oh, he's done. Oh, she, she got done like two months ago, and, you know. Oh, he's been done for 20 years. And it's like, you know, I think, what am I, am I supposed to like stick a fork in them? What's the, what's the deal? They're all done, <laughs> you know. But my sense is that awakening is a kind of gradual unfolding. It's a process. You know, it's a verb, it's not a noun. Just like we're verbs, we're not nouns. You know, we're in this constant state of development, of flux, you could say, of fluidity. And I think the unfolding of awakening happens that way. It's very, very different from person to person. And the depth of awakening is different from person to person. So when we first have a kind of what we would call an awakening, we're convinced, like I say, pre-awakening, we're kind of centered on me, 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 thinking I'm the center, thinking I'm really the central issue here, and that everything is filtered, everything is perceived through the filter of my personality, you know, which amounts to what I like, what I don't like, you know, my preferences, basically and the preferences that are kind of working together to, to facilitate a life where I get always what I want and I avoid always what I don't want. So that's kind of how we are pre-awakening. Then we wake up to the witness, to the observer, to that aspect of the self, of the universal self, that observes, that observes kind of objectively, that sees the objects, from this complete, this sort of very absolute subjectivity. So that's a kind of interesting aspect of the self that's very useful because before that, we're perceiving everything through the filter of the personality. We're kind of bogged down by that, aren't we? You know, we don't really see things in the proper perspective because we're judging them all based on our personal preferences. So what happens is we awaken to what some people would call the witness consciousness, which is certainly an awakening to the self, to one aspect of the self. But like I say, there's different depths. It's not the deepest aspect of the self. It's maybe more of a, you could almost call it a superficial aspect of the self, the observer, the witness. The problem with it is, is that it it actually it helps us, it, it gets us beyond the duality of thinking, I am the, per, my, the personal me is the center of everything, gets us beyond that, but it's still a kind of dual position, isn't it? It's the, it's the first and second aspect of that aphorism by Shankara, where the world is illusion, illusion, only Brahman is real. So you could say, that which is witnessed is illusion, only the witness is real. And you get a lot of people that get that far in their non-dual journey, and they think they're a Buddha. They think they're done, like I said before. They think they're, stick a fork in me, you know, I'm finished. Because now I see the truth that the world is illusion, and only the witness is real. Adya talks about how at every point of awakening, for us, it feels very complete, you know, because that's how far we've gotten. It's like if you're on your way from New York City to San Francisco, when you get to uh, Fairfield, Iowa, <laughs> you kind of think, you think, oh, this is the end of the journey. I'm in Fairfield, Iowa. You know, but it, it is the end of the journey so far. So it feels like the end, kind of. 
But if you, if you persevere and move forward, you'll get to California. You'll get to San Jose. You'll get to Dolce Hayes Mount Mansion. You know, and you go, wow, we're not in Fairfield anymore, Toto. You know, <laughs> there's palm trees here, you know. And that happens on the spiritual journey too, you know. We think that every step of the journey is the final frontier. But it's not. And you know what? I have a little secret. It never is. Because it just keeps growing and growing. So when we get to that point of the second part of the aphorism, where the world is illusory, that which is witnessed is illusory, only the witness is real, we've come you could say halfway in the journey, halfway up the mountain. You know, what we've seen is true so far, but there's another part of the aphorism, isn't, it? isn't there? The world is Brahman. The witnessed is the witness. You know, that's a point of the journey that I've taken to calling the collapse of the witness. Where we realize that that which witnesses and that which is, which is witnessed are really not two, after all. In the act of witnessing, the witness and the witnessed collapse. And all there is is witnessing. All there is is oneness. And that's when we move to a deeper aspect, a deeper dimension of the self. And that's where the revelation that we hear in so many religions, and especially in my own religion, the Christian religion, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we hear a lot this phrase, God is love. And what that's really pointing to is that phase in the journey where we come to understand God beyond the witness. The witness collapses, and we realize that the witness and the witnessed are one. The witness itself is an absolute, unconditional openness. It's open to anything that arises within it. And everything that arises, arises within it. So it embraces and loves everything that arises within it. And that's when the world is Brahman. That's when the witnessed is the witness. That's when we come to a real oneness. True non-duality. The halfway non-duality is still pretty dual. Because there's a witness that's real and there's the witness that's not real. Count them, too. But when the witness collapses, then the witness also collapses. And there's just one reality. There's one love in which everything is appearing and disappearing. And that's the phase of the integration of humanity with divinity, where divinity is all embracing of even the human experience that arises within it, which we all have. You know, there's all these bodies in this room with all these beautiful faces, each one unique, each one different. I've often compared that human side of who we are to stained glass windows, and I love that analogy. Because the, stained glass, the beauty of a stained glass window is not so much even in the window itself. It's partly in the window, but it's also a lot about the sun, about the sun shining through the window. So the stained glass window reflects the glory of God, the reality of God, each in a unique way, but it's the same light through every window. And yet each one reflects that in its own special way, in its own unique way, never ever seen again. And that's the truth of all of you in this room. You know, all of you are the formless in form. You're the divine incarnated as a human being and as a particular individual human being, not as one big amalgam kind of of consciousness floating around disembodied. No, it's in all these beautiful forms. It's a lot like the fingers on a hand. You know, your fingers on your hand are each individual's. There's a pinky finger, there's a ring finger, a middle finger, an index finger, and a thumb, and they're all useful for various things. Middle finger, when you're driving on the freeway, very useful. <laughs> you 
The ring finger, if you get married, very useful. The pinky finger, if you're drinking tea in London, very useful. The thumb, if you're hitchhiking, like my friend George did when he was 18 and almost got killed, very useful. And the index finger, very useful if you're perceiving things through your human judgment, because you can point the finger. But remember, there's three pointing back at you. Remember that old saying? So all of our fingers have their own function, their own usefulness, their own utility. So they're definitely individuals, aren't they? You know, you could say, yeah, they're individuals, but are they separate? No. So it's the same with our humanity and our divinity. We share in the one divinity, but it's incarnated uniquely and beautifully in each one of us in our own way. We're all like kind of priceless works of art that have never been seen before, will never be seen again for all eternity. How's the time? More than 10 minutes left? Yeah? How much, how much left? 20. 20 minutes. Oh, good. Okay. So my sense is that the trajectory of awakening has these two movements. The transcendent movement and the movement back into imminence. So a transcendent movement and imminent movement. A movement up and out of humanity and toward divinity, and then a movement back down into humanity, bringing divinity into the nitty-gritty, into the daily life, into our relationships, into our careers, into our activity in the world, into all the, the kind of aspects of human life that need to be addressed, you know? There's this uh, little thing that went around in evangelical Christianity where they, people wore ball caps and t-shirts and said, WWJD, what would Jesus do? You know, And we laugh at that and it seems kind of funny on one level. But on another level, there's a message there. What would divinity do? You know, when, we're, when we're integrating divinity back into humanity, we can ask ourselves that question all day long. And just ask it as an open-ended question, almost like a Zen koan. And then if we've had some awakening to this transcendent dimension of divinity, we can just open, we can just, it's kind of like that question, who am I? You know, what would divinity do in this situation on the freeway, in the grocery store, with my partner who's yelling at me, with my boss who's demanding, with the children who aren't doing what I want them to do? You know, the vast majority of our lives is made up of these seemingly mundane things. You know, it's all well and good to talk about transcendence and get into altered states of consciousness and come to conferences and get into a spiritual high or go to a satsang or whatever. But then Monday morning, the alarm goes off. What would divinity do? Sleep five more minutes? <laughs> and maybe it would. <laughs> but our lives are made up predominantly of ordinary, everyday human things. And any spirituality worth its salt has to address that. It has to engage that. You know, if it doesn't, it's not really being effective. It doesn't translate into life very well. If it's all about just reaching some transcendent state and then just hanging out there till Jesus comes or whatever. You know? So I think it's important for us to realize that the trajectory of awakening involves both a transcendence of humanity and a kind of trickling down back into humanity. That humanity has to be risen up to divinity and then divinity has to come back and incarnate itself and express itself through humanity. Both movements are important. Neither movement can be done away with. And neither movement negates the other. They're two sides of a coin. And I think more and more in the non-dual world, people are getting that. People have kind of had awakenings into transcendence. And they've hung out there for five years, for 10 years, for 20 years. And they're beginning to feel like something is missing. 
There are aspects of my life that this doesn't seem to be addressing. And even though I can have a belief that says that they're all illusory, are they really so totally illusory? You know? Are our relationships with our partners, are our relationships with our children, is our career completely illusory, something to just be dismissed? Certainly, it's not ultimately real in the sense that it's not eternal. But there's a relative reality to it that can sometimes have a kind of importance. You know, and as I say, it makes up a large, makes up the lion's share of our lives in the world. So I think in a way, that's what my own tradition of mystical Christianity has to bring to the table this incarnational spirituality, this entering of divinity into humanity as symbolized in the story of Jesus. But one thing I've come to is that the story of Jesus is not just about Jesus. It's about you. It's about me. You know? We're all called to be Christ's in the world. The presence of God in the world. And we each do that in a wonderfully unique way. So I think this message of integrating humanity and divinity is really important. It's crucial. And I talk about it a lot. I think it's a big, it's kind of a big part of my message. It's an essential part of my message. And I think if you look deeply, you will find it in all the traditions of transformation. You'll find it. Because all of them, if they perdure, they have to be inclusive. They have to be comprehensive. They have to address all the dimensions of life, you know, a spirituality, for it to be whole, for it to be complete. So it's something that I talk about a lot. And I just have a new book coming out called um, Fully Human, Fully Divine. It's all about this. Because I think that is the whole trajectory of the spiritual journey. It's an absolutely divine journey, but it's also a very human journey. And we're all invited to that journey. We're all invited to embrace our divinity and to embrace our humanity. So my wish for all of you is that you find that in your own life. Full embrace of your divinity, absolutely owning the divine, transcendent, absolute aspect of who you are, and living from that, but living from that in a very human way, allowing that to inform and infiltrate and permeate your ordinary life in the world that will take you out into the world and bring you Bring the light of God into the world. There's a beautiful prayer. I'll just close the talk with that, and then we'll open for questions. And I've said it, I used it before. I use it a lot. I've done whole retreats on this prayer when I used to be a monk. But I love it. It's by Cardinal Newman. And it's called Radiating Christ. So just replace Christ with whatever Buddha, Krishna, just inner light, whatever is meaningful for you. Christ is just a symbol pointing to this divinity that's within all of us. That's, in the, that's at the essence of who we are. And the prayer goes like this. Dear Jesus, help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess my whole being so utterly that every soul I come in contact with may feel your presence in my soul. Let them look up and see no longer me, but only the Christ. Stay with me, then I shall begin to shine as you shine. So to shine as to be a light to others. The light, O Christ, will be yours. None of it will be mine. It will be you shining on others through me. Let me thus praise you in the way you love best, by shining on those around me. Let me preach you without preaching, not by words, but by my example, by the catching force, by the sympathetic influence of all that I do, by the evident fullness of the love my heart bears. 
Amen.